and day and night Well, I can't explain it It's simple and true And it started not too long ago When God made a change It made a difference He placed His love deep in my soul The love down deep in my heart Makes me want to shout and sing Of which Jesus can bring the joy that's a bubbling up ever since I made my new start. Makes me want to tell everybody I see about his love down deep in my heart. I'm not fit to be a servant, but Jesus has made me an heir to that eternal kingdom. I think I'll stay with the old past. I like my Bible. I like old time music, like old time preaching. I think I'll just stick with it. Amen. Let's stand together tonight and try to get everybody settled down now. There's folk, just let's all stand together. There's folk kind of in and out. Let's kind of get everybody settled down while the preacher's preaching. I don't even have to watch everybody walking in and out of the building. So let's do our best, get settled down here and uh, enjoy God's man. Good to see a good number here tonight. And preacher, I don't believe they're here because of chicken wings. I think they're here because they love Jesus. I do. Some of them ain't about to eat them anyway because they know if they do, oh, it's going to be rough. And, uh, but anyway, Brother Hamlin told me, he said, my soul, he said, I got to eat one of them chicken wings. Oh, you talked about them. But uh, anyway, uh, now I found out something about Brother Hamlin today. Brother Hamlin is from uh, right, right outside, right outside, 30 minutes outside of Detroit, Michigan. Well, I found out today that he is not a Yankee. He said there's a huge difference between a northerner and a Yankee. Right? And he said there's a huge difference. And so he said he's a northerner, but he's not a Yankee. He said he and Brother Joe Arthur would be brothers if it wasn't for the Civil War. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's good to have Brother Hamlin with us preaching. You preach and pulpit's all yours, my friend. Thank you, my friend. God Amen. bless you. Thank you so much. Open your Bibles, the book of Revelation, chapter number 7. I have thoroughly enjoyed every second being back at the Great Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. I'll be forever grateful for that day when God allowed my path to cross with the Hazlip family and I believe knitted our hearts together. They're not acquaintances, they're not associates, but they're actual friends. Someone has said that if you live 60 to 70, 75 years, you'll have 14,000 acquaintances and only seven friends. I don't know how true that is, but if it is accurate, on that short list of friends, no question, no controversy, would be the names of the Hayslip family. 
I love them. I appreciate them. I thank God for them. In fact, if you don't like Dr. Hazlip and his sweet family, I don't like you. And so I've been absolutely honored and humbled to be here for just a handful of hours. There's much that's wrong with America. But when you flip that coin over, there's still much that's right with America. And one of the things that's right with America is a preacher and a preacher's wife, a preacher's family, a church family that's of the cut and caliber of the Hazlips and the Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. Ms. Hazlip, so good to see you tonight and that individual who hangs around you. So appreciate you coming and being in the service tonight. Uh, I still don't know my son-in-law's name and I've never thought it was important to learn. Maybe one day I will. And uh, this one that tags along, Mrs. Hazlip, he's Miss Hazlip, he's not a son-in-law, but I wouldn't learn his name. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't. But I appreciate you being in the service tonight. And thank you so much for coming. I've enjoyed the choir. Thank you, Brother James, for the privilege of singing in the choir. I uh, do not have a singing voice. I have the kind of voice that when you call me before 12, you'll say, I'm sorry, I woke you up. And if you call me after 12, you'll say, I'm sorry, you're not feeling good. And uh, neither of those things are true. I think when I was a baby, I had a singing voice, but my mother dropped me on my throat, and I've never had, I've never had a singing voice. But boy, I was in tall cotton tonight to be able to sing with this great choir. No question, one of my favorite choirs all across America. I mean, just drips with old-time religion. And thank you, Brother James, for the privilege of singing in the choir tonight. I was thinking this afternoon about the uh, old emphasis and the emphasis of excellence here at the Calvary Baptist Church. And boy, I tell you what, you are a blessed people to have a man of God like this and to have a preacher's wife like you have and a church family like this. You are a blessed, blessed, blessed people. And I appreciate so much that I never wonder, I never worry, where is Dr. Hazlitt? He's standing in the same place today that he stood yesterday. And the older I get, the more I appreciate preachers that you can count on and that are consistent. Dr. Hazlip, happy birthday, and that's just an added blessing to be here for your birthday celebration. Book of Revelation, chapter number 7, and I'll take but one verse of Scripture for our text, and it will be verse number 17. Book of Revelation, chapter number 7, uh, and verse number 17. I prayed much about what the Lord would have me preach this morning and again tonight, and uh, before I even got on the plane, to fly from Detroit to uh, Greensboro last night. Before I ever got on the plane, I knew what I was to preach Sunday morning and Sunday night. Amen. I like it when it happens that way. Yes, there's sometimes, and Brother Hazlip, you know, you preach here all the time and travel and preach. There's sometimes that uh, you'll be waiting to preach in the choir uh, or the special music will be going on and you still don't have a green light from God. So I liked it that before I ever got on the plane, I knew what was, I was to preach, what I was to preach Sunday morning, and what I'm to preach tonight. And so I would be absolutely, I'd be absolutely in disobedience to God if I didn't preach what I'm going to attempt to preach tonight. Book of Revelation, chapter number 7, and verse number 17. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them, under living fountains of waters. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I want you to focus in on that four-letter word, wipe. W-I-P-E, wipe. Do you see it? There it is, the word wipe. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject tonight, God's heavenly Handkerchief. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If I know my heart, I want to be a blessing. But the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit, 
place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts tonight, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I am away. Give us fresh warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from tonight. Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. I had made a mental note, made a mental note to thank Dr. and Mrs. Hazlip and the church family of the Calvary Baptist Church for the comfortable motel room, delicious meals, warm times of fellowship, every act of kindness. When I got to my room, there was a kind note and uh, the bottle of cologne that I wear. And I so appreciate how gracious these folks are. I believe that you could write uh, a book on hosting and having people at your place, and it certainly would be a bestseller. I think I could hint about having a bag of marijuana and needing it. <clears throat> of course, for medical purposes, and I, I believe the pastor's wife would come through and would get me a bag of medical marijuana. Somewhere in the glory world, possibly in a special closet or even in a select drawer, the Heavenly Father has stored some very sacred items. A person could imagine that in that storage space may be Abraham's knife, David's harp, John the Baptist's camel coat, and even Paul's pen. But if there is such a storehouse, then on one of its shelves is a huge hanky of the most gentle and gathering silk. It'll only be used on the saints in the economy, in the economy of eternity. God's heavenly handkerchief. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, we find God seals a remnant of Israel and sends a redeemed company of Gentiles. Now this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this. The sealing of God's servants on earth verses 1 through 8, and then the singing of God's servants in heaven, verses 9 through 17. It is while the Apostle John is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the singing of God's servants in heaven that an individual sees one of the most touching scenes that will take place in the city of forever happiness. Verse 17, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Although, Dr. Hazlip, the particular words, handkerchief, a napkin, or a hanky, are not seen in the Scripture, the principle is clearly seen. Evangelist Oliver B. Green, God bless his sainted memory, once wrote about our text, let me say that the words, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, are unequaled in depth and tenderness. He went on, to say, went on to say, it is not the compassionate lamb who shed his blood, who wipes the tears from their eyes, but God the Father who gave the lamb. God against whom they and we have sinned. And then Oliver B. Green ties up his thought by simply writing, they will enjoy everlasting consolation, and they will enjoy peace uninterrupted. Now the word wipe in the Greek language means to smear out, to wipe away, or to obliterate. The sister verse of Revelation 7 and 17 is Isaiah 25, 8. And as I've said many times in many different services and meetings, every verse in the Bible has what I call a sister verse. And often that sister verse throws more light 
upon the verse that you're musing, meditating, or making a study of. Again, the sister verse of Revelation 7 and 17 is Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Never forget the tear that the saint sheds today on earth may be removed from their cheek tomorrow in eternity. Now, if you miss everything that I preach tonight, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating the tear. That's liquid emotion. The tear, the tear that the saint sheds today on earth may be removed from their cheek tomorrow in eternity. Friend, you and I, those of us that are saved, should be encouraged by this exciting yet future experience. Now, I'm mindful of the fact that our text is for the future. Our text is for the future. I'm mindful of that. But although it is for the future, it still is for today. Because not only will God in the future bring out his heavenly handkerchief, but God for today brings out his heavenly handkerchief as well. There are at least three times on the pages of the Bible that the Heavenly Father now, oh, we know he'll do it later, but now there wipes uh, the tears from his children. Let's quickly notice it tonight. Now, you may want to take out a pencil and somewhere uh, in your Bible, scratch, scratch these things down, but my, how it would be far better if God were to take an eternal pen and write these things upon my heart and upon your heart as well. God's heavenly handkerchief. Number one, anxious speaking. Isaiah 38, 5. Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. God will use his heavenly handkerchief when his children are in anxious speaking. In Isaiah 35, 8, the prophet Isaiah tells us that King Hezekiah had a divine death sentence placed upon his head. But because he got a hold of heaven with a prayer that was saturated with his tears, his life was spared. Not only was it saved, but 15 years, 5,000 475 days more were there set on the end of his existence. By now, you have figured out that I'm not alluding to man speaking in man's ear, uh, but I'm addressing man speaking in God's ear. Uh, this was not the standard. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I were to die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take type of talking to God. From the first word of the monarch's prayer uh, to the last word, tears baptized is pleading with the master. E.M. Bounds, who I call on a personal note, the apostle of prayer, once said, uh, their prayer is the language of a man burdened with the sense of a need. That same note of truth is struck upon in the old hymn of the church uh, where the songwriter pens, I must tell Jesus all my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, uh, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. Friend, you and I need to know that God uh, will use his heavenly handkerchief when we are in anxious speaking. The Bible says in Isaiah 58, 9, uh, Then uh, shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. Newsflash, prayers that are bookend by pathos are often the same prayers that are put on a fast track to being answered. Oh, child of God, it just might be uh, that what is keeping God 
from giving you uh, a returned wayward child, a next door neighbor converted, or even a sizable gift from glory is simply a tear that serves as an exclamation point at the end of that supplication. Oh, I know our text is for later, but at the same time, our text is for now because God has a heavenly handkerchief and he breaks that heavenly handkerchief out. He brings that heavenly handkerchief when his children are in anxious speaking. Dr. John I. Rice was, of course, the founding editor of the Sword of the Lord. And he once told about an apprehensive answer to prayer while holding a revival meeting in 1932 in a Midwestern state where he needed uh, $920 for his young uh, infant Uh, They are new newspaper. He states, I quote, with tears. He states, I quote, with tears. Don't miss it. He states, I quote, with tears. That Thursday night, I turned to prayer. I reminded God of a covenant I'd made with him in 1926 uh, that he was to look after my business and I would trust him and look after his. I remember that I said to God, Lord, Look on the heading of that paper. It has your name on it, the sword of the Lord. Your name is in big type, mine in small type. It's your paper, not mine. You pay your bills. If you don't want this paper, then let it die. It's not my worry, it's yours. And so Dr. Rice wrote, uh, with peace, I went to sleep. He continued to say that the next night we had some people saved. They took an offering from me for the 10 days' time. The check was $25. In sweet peace, I took the train that night to Dallas, though I sleep poorly as a rule unless I can stretch out and relax on a regular bed. That night, Dr. Rice said, I slept as sweetly as a child in that chair car. The next morning, as my train, the Rock Island rocket, left Wichita, Kansas, the porter came through the car holding a telegram calling my name. I took the telegram, opened it, and read from my secretary, you've just received a check for $1,000 for your work. Dr. Rice wrote, I walked up and down that aisle, uh, clutching that telegram, laughing, praising God in my soul. I could hardly refrain from telling Porter, hostess, and passengers how God answers prayer. Oh, I want you to know what might be keeping your prayer from being answered. What might be keeping that prayer from breaking through. What might be keeping that prayer from getting a hold of God. It's just a simple tear. It's just liquid emotion because God has a heavenly handkerchief and he breaks that heavenly handkerchief out and brings that heavenly handkerchief when we're in anxious speaking number two let me hasten I know I'm going to get stuck here number two in awful strain Matthew 26 75 and Peter remembered the word of Jesus which said unto him before the cock crow thou thou should deny me thrice and he went out and wept bitterly God will use his heavenly handkerchief when his children <coughs> are in awful strain. In Matthew 26, 75, the apostle Matthew tells us that the second Peter hears the barnyard alarm clock. He recollects how that the lovely Lord Jesus Christ had said to him how, had, how that he had reached the place of being a rebel. Evangelist Oliver V. Green, if I may quote him again, once said about this scene in Scripture, uh, the roosters crowing here had more results than some liberals and modernists have in all of their ministry. This casebook example of getting away from God always embarks the very same way. But Peter uh, followed him afar off, Matthew 26, 58, and ends the very same way. And he went out and wept bitterly, Matthew 26, 75. This just in, afar off is day one in backsliding. Did you hear me? Afar off is day one in backsliding. Afar off, it, 
Now listen, hey, Joyce Myers won't tell you that, but John Hamlin will. Uh, far off is day one, is day one, is day one in backsliding. And Peter being a case book of getting away from God is also a case book of getting back to God. And the way one gets back to God is always the same. And there has to be tears. Would you quickly turn to Matthew chapter 26? Because there's several reasons why believers that are backslidden weep when they finally get right with God. Have you ever wondered, preacher, have you ever wondered, people, why somebody will come back and they want to get back in the choir and we certainly want them to. And they want to get back teaching in the Sunday school class and we certainly want them to. And they want to get back soul winning and we certainly uh, we want them to. But it just seems like as soon as they get back, they're gone again. Friend, I believe the Bible makes it crystal clear that if there is not a brokenness, if there is not a burden when we come back, we will not stay back because we never really came back. That does not mean that I have to see your tears. That does not mean the church has to see your tears. That does not mean that the pastor needs to see your tears. But hear me and hear me well. If there is not a brokenness, if there is not a tear, if there's not a burden about you getting out, you'll never get back in because here is the Bible case example of not only getting away from God, but getting back to God and getting back to God, there's got to be a tear. There's several things that every backslider weeps about when they really get right with God. First of all, found here in Matthew chapter 26, they understand how they hurt self. Verse 58, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Uh, a reason why every backslider weeps when he finally gets right with God is clearly seen from the experience of Peter. They understand how they hurt self. Um, no backslider ever comes back with a glowing testimony how, how being wrong with God was good for them and their family. Now, Dr. Hazel, if I've been in thousands of services, sir, you've been in thousands of services and I've yet to hear anybody stand and testify and say, well, I tell you what, best thing for me and my family is when I backslid. Best thing for me and my loved ones is when I got out of church. Best thing, don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Best thing that ever happened to me is when I got out of the will of God. I've never heard that. You sure have never heard it. Nobody else has ever heard it. Because you know what? When you finally get right with God, you weep hot, bitter tears because you realize how your backsliding hurt Self. A few years ago, Mrs. Hazlett and Mrs. Hamlin was with me in a meeting. And a lady came to the book table and she said to Mrs. Hamlin, I know that Dr. Hamlin's extremely busy and there must be times where he's on the other side of the country and you're home alone, home alone sitting on the couch. And uh, she said, there has to be times when uh, uh, you just feel bad and you miss him and, and you want him to be home sitting on the couch holding your hand. And I kind of eavesdropped a little bit because I wanted to hear what Mrs. Hamlin would say to that. And she looked at that lady and she said, yes, ma'am, I miss him a great deal, but I would much rather have him on the other side of the country preaching in the will of God and God bless him him and I than for him to be home sitting on the couch holding my hand and God wearing us both out. Say amen right there. In fact, this is better than you're letting on. It really is. You see, a backslider always weeps when they finally get right with God because they understand how their backsliding hurt self. Secondly, they understand how they hurt sinners. Verse 70, but he denied them before all. Oh, a reason why every backslider weeps when they finally get right with God. Seen clearly from the experience of Peter is they understand how they hurt sinners. Prodigals that come back always regret the seeds of doubt that they've sown in unbelievers' hearts towards Bible Christianity. Oh, I've had backsliders say to me when they've gotten right, man, I wish I hadn't got away from God. I wish I hadn't got out of church. 
I wish I hadn't been a bad testimony. And in every single time, Brother James, I'll probe a little bit and I'll push a little bit. And they'll ask, uh, they'll act like, it was just five minutes ago that they got right with God, but more times than not, it was 20 and 25 and 30 and 35 years, and it still haunts them. You know why it haunts them? They understand that they're backsliding. Hurt, hurt, hurt sinners. And thirdly, from this narrative, we see the reason that the backslider weeps every time they get right with God it's because they understand how they hurt the Savior. Verse 75, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus. Oh, a reason why backsliders weep when they finally get right with God, seen clearly from the experience of Peter, is they understand how they hurt the Savior. Nothing breaks the backslider's heart like the knowledge of their backsliding broke the Lord Jesus Christ's heart. Oh, when I miss my Bible reading, it breaks Jesus' heart. When I miss my prayer time, it breaks Jesus' heart. When I miss uh, those golden opportunities to tell a hell-bound sinner how they can be saved uh, and heaven-blessed, uh, it breaks uh, the Savior's heart. My, what a revival we'd have if we could just get the people of God to understand uh, that our sinning and our strain breaks the Savior heart, all oh, that every single believer that was in this service would realize the reasons why they weep when they finally get right with God is because they understand how their backsliding hurt self, hurt sinners, and hurt the Savior. Years ago, I was holding a seven-day revival meeting at the Canaan Baptist Church in Taylor, Michigan. And one night during that revival meeting, Dr. Hazlett, a sweet lady, came. And to, and to show you how long ago this was, she came to my tape table. <laughs> I say that and some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. But there was a day when preaching was on tape. I don't mean scotch tape, duct tape, electrical tape. But there was a day when preaching was on tape. Now, I do not go back to the day when preaching was on tablets. That's Moses' day. But um, I do go back to the day when preaching was on tape. And uh, this dear lady came to my then tape table. She said, Brother Hamlin, do you have a moment? I said, yes, ma'am. How can I help you? She said, I want to say a story. She said, uh, several years ago, she said, uh, uh, my family and I, we were members of this church. And uh, she said, we, we uh, uh, got out of church and we got away from God. And let me just uh, pause for station identification and tell you that when you and I get out of church, we're going to get away from God. Hello? It's not rocket science. That, that first service you miss is the first step that you take in going the wrong way. And she said, we got out of church, our family did. And she said, it wasn't very long until we, we got away from God. And she said, then it wasn't very long until, uh, oh, on a, on a Thursday night, folks from the Canaan Baptist Church came and uh, they rang our doorbell and they visited us and they told us how much they missed us. And, and, and I love this, uh, Dr. Hazelip, she said, and, and they, weren't, they weren't harsh with us. They weren't hard on us. Can a brother get a witness? They just said, we, we miss you, and it's not the same not having you there. And, and by the way, save the preaching for the preacher. Save the preaching for the preacher. If someone comes back that hasn't been here in a long time, don't you dare beat up on them. Don't you dare hit them in the head with your Bible. You absolutely shake their hand, hug their neck, and say, man, we're glad to have you back. It's great to have you back. I mean, it's just in the same without you. Leave the preaching to the preacher. She said they were so kind. And they said, boy, sis, we miss you and your husband and son, and it's just not the same not having you there. And she said, well, we're, we're, we're really not uh, out of church. She said, but Dr. Hamlin, we were. And she said, I said to them, we're really not away from God. But she said, Dr. Hamlin, I, I, I was, my family was, but we just said, we'll be back. And, and I mean, who knows, we may be there this, this coming Sunday. And she said, I'd say that, and they'd smile, and they'd be so happy genuinely. And uh, Sunday would come, and Sunday would go. And, and she said, uh, we wouldn't be there. But the next Thursday night, here they come. 
And they'd knock on the door, they'd ring the doorbell, and she said they'd act like they weren't there the Thursday before and genuinely said, boy, we missed you, and it's just not the same. And man, we have a service, it's a family reunion, and boy, we want all the family there. And she said they couldn't have been more genuine, they couldn't have been any more real, they couldn't have been any more uh, sincere. And I'd say to them, well, we're, we're not away from God, and we're not really out of church, but she said, Brother Hamlin, both those things were true. And she said, you know, we, we, just, we just might be there. We just might be there this coming Sunday. And she said, boy, they'd get so excited and tears would well up in their eyes and they'd say, oh, that's great. We, we got to have you come back. And Sunday would come and Sunday would go. We weren't there. She said, the following Thursday night, here they come. Here they come. Just like they hadn't been there the prior Thursday night. And she said, this went on for several, several, several months. In fact, into a year it went on. Every Thursday night they'd come. And every Thursday night they would say, boy, we miss you and we want you to come back. And it's not the same without you. And she said, every Thursday night I'd, I'd kind of allude to the fact that we might be back and we might be there on Sunday. She said, but there was that one, there was that one in particular last Thursday night they came. I looked at them and said, I promise you, we'll be there Sunday. She said they were excited every time that I would say, we're coming, we may be there, we'll be back. But that, that Thursday night that I promised we'd be there, oh, she said it was just like they almost shouted. Uh, they almost, I mean, absolutely ran a lap around the living room when I said, I promise we'll be there Sunday. Well, this time tears were welling up in her eyes. She said, but Brother Hamlin, Sunday came, and Sunday went, we weren't there. She said, in fact, that, that Sunday morning, uh, my husband and I decided that we would go to a nearby park that uh, had a lake, and, and we'd have a picnic. It was in the summer of the year, and so my husband put the boat on the trailer on the back of our uh, station wagon, and, and I packed a, a summer lunch, and uh, we got our son, and we went to the lake, and uh, before lunch, uh, uh, my husband said, is there enough time for me uh, to take uh, our son out to uh, fish a little bit? And she said, I think there's time. I'll get the noon meal ready, and so they they took the uh, boat uh, off of the trailer on the back of the station wagon. They put it in the lake, uh, in the water, and pushed out from shore. And I don't know, she said they fished for some maybe 30, 40 minutes. And I got uh, the noon meal ready. I got lunch ready. I took out the picnic basket, and I got the red and white uh, checked uh, um, tablecloth that we were to use as a blanket. And I put out the sandwiches, and I put out the cold watermelon, and I put out the iced tea, and I had lunch all ready. And she said, I looked up to, to call the men. And she said, when I looked up to call the men, just about that time, she said, I saw Brother Hamlin, the boat that my husband and son were in flip over. And she said, I knew that there was no life jacket on that boat. And she said, I knew that neither my husband or son could swim. And she said, from the shore of that lake, she said, I watched them as they struggled. And as they went down for the last time, she said, I cannot swim. All I could do was stand on that shore and call and cry for help. And she said, I watched them drown. Soon the state troopers came and soon the county skin divers came and soon the... Folks from the morgue medical examiner came. And she said, I watched as they fished the lifeless bodies of my son and husband out of that lake and put them on a gurney and wrap them in a bed sheet and stick them in the back of that medical examiner's van. By now, tears were coursing down her cheeks uh, and landing on the linoleum of the floor of that church and splashing up on my shoes. And she said, Brother Hamlin, when they put those lifeless bodies in the back of that medical examiner's van, she said, I looked up to heaven with tears coursing down my cheeks and I said, okay, God, you've got my attention. She turned and pointed 
at the church door. And she said, from that day to this, the church door doesn't squeak. But when I'm in the house of God, she said, but the sad thing is, I have to pass the cemetery where my son and husband are buried, which are sobering reminders of what it took for God to get my attention. Oh, dear friend, God has a heavenly handkerchief and he breaks that heavenly handkerchief out. He brings that heavenly handkerchief when his children are in awful strain. I know our text is for later. I know it is. I know where it falls in eschatology. But not only is it for later, it's for now too. Awful strain. And then number three, and last of all, my time is gone. Not only anxious speaking, an awful strain, but number three, and last of all, arduous soul winning. Acts 20, 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. God will use this heavenly handkerchief with his children when they are an arduous soul winning. That word arduous means not easy to do. In Acts 20, 31, the physician Luke tells us about the apostle Paul saying his goodbyes. To the preachers in Ephesus, he recounts to them how he tried to reach their metropolis, not only with truth, listen, but also tears. For 1,095 days from a.m. to p.m., Brother Paul left a trail of tears to every sinner's heart in this boundary. A person must keep in the forefront of their mind that the large city of Ephesus was not only an economic hub and a cultural hub, why it had a theater uh, that would uh, seat 25,000 people, but also a, a religious hub. The Temple of Diana was there and other false gods who just their images were pornographic. Uh, this was not what I'm trying to say, the Bible Belt of the Middle East. But in spite of all that, and the apostle of the Gentiles used his tears to turn hearts towards the cross of Calvary. Friend, you and I need to know that God will use this heavenly handkerchief when we are an arduous soul winning. The Bible says in Psalm 126.6, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Here's a word of knowledge for the fundamental church and the fundamental Christian of the 21st century. Instead of trying a new soul winning technique, how about if we get back to old tears? Let me ask you a question tonight. If you knew before you got saved or learned after you got saved that someone wept over your soul, would you just lift your hand and leave it? Would you lift your hand and leave it? If you knew before, after you got saved, that somebody wept for you, would you lift your hand and leave it? Why, in every single section, in every single section, there are people that can raise their hand and say, somebody wept over me. Somebody had a burden for me. Someone shed a tear for me. And friend, you may put your hands down. Thank you. If it worked for you, it'll work for others as well. You see, God, he has a heavenly handkerchief and he breaks that heavenly handkerchief out. He brings that heavenly handkerchief when his children are in arduous soul winning. One of my favorite preachers of the past is Dr. R.G. Lee. Dr. R.G. Lee was in every sense of the word an orator. He could preach and paint uh, pictures with words. In fact, he had the ability of what I call uh, Dr. Hazlip uh, playing uh, marbles on the coattails of comets. He powerfully illustrated this truth that I'm trying to drive home to each and every one of our hearts. He, he told that he uh, went to the house of a dear lady who was a member of a church uh, there, in, uh, there in Memphis, the Bellevue Baptist Church, and uh, she lived in a cheap uh, shack of a house. And uh, the boy, he had money uh, to buy booze or son, but he didn't have any money to buy furniture or nice things for his mom where he lived. This boy's mother said, Pastor to Dr. Lee, I've got to unload. 
He said, sis, go ahead and unload. She began to cry. She said, what are we going to do about my wicked boy? He comes home drunk and he bites me. And then she pulled up her little sleeve and showed fresh bite marks on her arm. She said, he came home last night and bit me. And then this morning before he went to work, she pulled up the other sleeve and said, he bit me again. He's in the demon of drink. And she said, what are we going to do about my wicked boy? And R.G. Lee said, I'm not sure what to do. He said, the last time I talked to him, he said, Dr. Lee, if you bring up Jesus again, I'll whoop you. He said, I'm willing to take a whooping for Jesus. He said, but I'm not really sure what we should do, sis, other than pray. Dr. Lee said, I hardly said the word prayer. Didn't even put a period behind it. But what that dear sister was on her knees, praying, and don't miss it, crying. Praying, and don't miss it, crying, praying, and all that I wouldn't miss it, uh, praying and crying. She said in her prayer, Oh God, save my wicked boy. If it means uh, my house being burned down, if it means me getting killed beneath an automobile, if it means me being blind, if it means me being paralyzed, God do whatever you have to do to get the attention of my wicked boy and save him. Dr. Lee said, I don't know how I prayed after that. He said, but I prayed. I told the sister goodbye. And then the next Sunday morning, he said, the next Sunday morning, I preached on the cross of gold and the great heart of God. He said, I didn't know that boy was there. But when I gave the invitation, he said the first one that stepped out was that boy and trailing him was his mother. He said, I came off the platform, I took his hand and the boy looked at me and said, Dr. Lee, I'm tired of being the devil's boy. I want to be God's boy. And that morning he was saved and surrendered to preach and for many years preached the gospel. I told you that Dr. Lee was one of my favorite preachers. Oh, on a regular basis, I read his sermons and am blessed, favored, and benefited. And I say this, Dr. Hazlip, with no respect or no disrespect. That morning, it wasn't the preaching of R.G. Lee. Oh, listen, I mean to tell you, played marbles on the coattails of comets, was an orator in every sense of the word, could paint uh, uh, pictures uh, with mere words. But that morning, I say it very respectfully. I wouldn't be disrespectful, not in a million years, but it wasn't the preacher's sermon that day. It was the parent's sob. Because you know what, God? He's got a heavenly handkerchief, and he brings that heavenly handkerchief. He breaks that heavenly handkerchief, and he uses it on his children when they're in arduous soul winning. Oh, I know our text is for tomorrow. I know where it falls in eschatology. I do. But at the same time, our text is for today. I'm so glad that God not only wipes tears away, yet in the future. He'll wipe tears yet away right now. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. God's heavenly handkerchief. Our text says, Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Anxious speaking. Awful strain. Arduous. Soul winning. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder, has there been a time in your life when you realized that you were lost and received Christ as your Savior? I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed who could lift their hand and say, Preacher, I know that I know that I know that I know that if I were to die right now, heaven would be my eternal home. I'm saved and sure. You'd lift it and leave it saved and sure. God bless you all over, all over. God bless you. 
Thank you. I put them down. You're here. You're here tonight and you couldn't raise your hand, but you would lift it now. And by raising it, you're saying, Preacher, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. Preacher, please pray for me. You lift your hand right now. Pray for me. God bless you. I see that hand. Would you look this way? You lifted your hand. Would you look this way? Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. Come on right now. Just come this way. Preacher's going to meet you, and we'll take an open Bible. That's it. Just step up. That's it, sir. Just stand up and come. That's it. That's it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Crabtree, this dear man's coming to be saved. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. You're here tonight, and as a Christian, you'd say, Preacher, I needed that. I needed to be reminded, or I needed to find out God has a heavenly handkerchief. And He breaks it out. He brings it out for His children. Anxious speaking. It's interesting, Dr. Hazlip. There's some things that I pray about and pray about and pray about. But it's interesting. When God breaks my heart for those things and tears escape my eye and land on the prayer list and smear the ink, it's amazing how quick those things get answered. Anxious speaking. Awful strain. Have you really wept when you supposedly got right? If you haven't, and I say it kindly, sweetly, and politely, if you've not been broken, you still aren't back. Because it's not until we are broken that we really do business with God. Arduous soul winning. Who have you witnessed to and witnessed to and witnessed to but now need to witness to with tears? We stand to our feet. Heavenly Father, thank you for the kind attention of these my brothers and sisters. Lord, I've had great liberty all day. In fact, beyond liberty if there is such a thing. And I'm thankful for a people who love Bible preaching. But Lord, now preaching is when you talk to us and the invitation is when we talk to you about what you have talked to us about. So I pray, Lord, this would not be a one-way conversation tonight, but a two-way conversation. And that at these old-fashioned altars, we now would talk to you in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed. Brother James begins to sing. I'm not even going to ask for the raising of hands. If God spoke to your heart and you needed the truth tonight, so our brother begins to sing. Right now, would you step out and come? Would you do it? That's it. That's it. That's right. Would you come? God's heavenly handkerchief. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Would you come? Face to face what Charles G. Finney was a great revivalist. And he said, Dr. Hazlitt, we'll never have revival until Mr. Amen and Mrs. Wet Eyes show up back in the church. Oh, I'm glad for that heavenly handkerchief. And when God breaks it out, when God brings it out, shall see him by and by here tonight and you've gotten cold on God here tonight and you've gotten a little clinical and and by that I mean we know when to say amen we know to say praise the Lord we know when to say hallelujah We know the church is Sunday night at 6 o'clock and we we know what happens on prayer meeting and we can get a little clinical. And that's where it's facts but the fire's gone. It's, It's right but the relationship is waning and wanting. 
rejoice in all his glory. I God's heavenly handkerchief. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Pastor comes. wait just a moment while these are praying. I want to mention this to you tonight. You can look this way. I've often been asked when you travel, people ask you, what do you see missing in churches in our day when you travel? What do you see is not there? I guess probably we have the most talent that the church has ever had. Probably some of the nicest buildings that the church has ever had. No doubt, some of the best speakers, orators, whatever word you want to use, that we've ever had. But you know what I tell people? Brokenness is missing. We are such a prideful people that we're so much full of pride that it's almost like we dare God to break us. But I'll say this to you. When I have someone I pastor and they get away from God, anger is not the first emotion that I feel. It's brokenness. It's brokenness. Because I know that someone that has tasted of the sweet grace of God walk away from it will never be happy until they come home. You can't enjoy something as big as God and get something that's wedged in and ever really have joy in your heart. I want to share this with you. I know some of you heard this. We'll go eat supper here, but Several years ago, I was preaching in Denton, North Carolina. There's a gentleman that service lost, raised his hand, he was lost. He had never trusted the Lord as his Savior. And I was preaching that night and I said, You need to be saved. I'm here tonight, I preached a message on hell. And that gentleman didn't raise his hand. Matter of fact, he shook his head no. I didn't know the story after the service, but. That man had said he'd never bowed to any man or any God. It's like what he'd say. His name was John Hinn. I knew him. I didn't know him, but I knew a little bit about him. I got done preaching that night, gave the invitation. John had made it clear that he was not going to come, but all of a sudden, during that invitation, he stepped out. He was a bad enough sinner. Well, all sin is bad, but he's a bad enough sinner that the sheriff of the county called the pastor and said these words, which are not biblical, right? Biblically right, but we get what he meant. He said, I sure am glad y'all got that guy saved. Sure am glad y'all saved that guy. He said, it'll take, cause us not to have near as much trouble. Well, when he came down to get saved, church just went ballistic. I mean, people crying and shouting and praising God. But off to my left, a lady was kneeling against the wall. She had no clue what was going on in the auditorium. She never looked up. She's praying. Next thing I notice, she gets up, she's weeping, and she gets up and she just starts crying and screaming and waving her hand. And she runs all the way across the auditorium and grabs Johnny around the neck, weeping all over him, mascara all over him, snot all over him. So I asked the pastor, I thought, what in the world? He said, preacher, that's his sister. And said, that little spot over there in the church for 25 years, years she has knelt in tears that dropped on that carpet 
And she begged God to not let her brother go to hell. Johnny's testimony was after. My sister's tears brought me to Christ. Is God always on time? One month later, Johnny was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And in just a few weeks, he died. Didn't know when he got saved he had it. But just a few weeks, tears move God. Amen. Did you enjoy the message tonight? Amen. Preach anything else you want to say tonight? I just want to say this to you real quick tonight. He has helped us today. Don't get away from the Lord. It's not worth it. I love doing things. I enjoy life. But there is nothing like serving God. If you ever do anything, if you ever put money, jobs, entertainment, anything in front of the Lord, you're not going to be happy. Not if you're a Christian. Because there's nothing better than serving Him. And then I want to say this tonight. If you ever do fail Him, don't just go to Him with an old attitude like, sorry about that, God. It's just so much I can say I'll shut up, but I'll never forget when I broke my daddy's heart one time and I thought he was going to take his belt off and have a come to Jesus meeting. Instead of doing that, he looked at me with tears running down his cheek and he said, son, you disappointed me. I wanted to get the belt off myself because the last thing I wanted to do was break the heart of my dad. And the last thing I want to do tonight is to break the heart of Jesus. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. What a wonderful day. Wonderful day. Hallelujah. Preacher, thank you. I feel that revival spirit. I love it. I've told our people, we're not here to entertain. Church has got entertaining too much. We just need to preach the Bible. Let God do the work. And He did. But we're going to have a good time of fellowship tonight. I'm excited about that. Looking forward to it. And... uh, I'm going to get Brother Hamlin up front so we can get him one of those fight for wings tonight. I think he'll like that. Miss Libby, or some of y'all want to give us directions? Is anybody? Brother Dermont, do you know what they want to do? Which way to go? I don't know. She's back there somewhere getting things ready, I assume. All right, so we'll just dismiss and I guess take off. Find out where you need to go. I know it's all happening in that room. And so, plus out here if need be. So we're going to pray. Brother Hamill, will you go back and shake hands? Appreciate you being with us. I want to say real quickly, around that way, Miss Wendy. Okay, thank you. So we are going through the double doors over here, then going in. Uh, I want to say real quickly, pray for Brother Hamlin. He'll be leaving early in the morning. Uh, going back to Michigan, has a meeting in Michigan. Preaches about every week of his life. Puts a lot in those sermons. They're not just something you throw on a piece of paper, three little points, and he puts a lot in that. And uh, it's been an honor to have McCaffrey. He'll be back with us in 2018, and we're excited about that. i tell you what, he's the kind of man who can preach the right stuff. God can break out in revival. I believe that. Amen. And uh, I love him. I appreciate the book. Amen. That's what we need. I hope you'll have a great week this week, and I trust that God will bless you. Let's have a prayer. We're going to go ahead and pray and ask God to bless the food tonight. And then y'all stick around for the pastor's birthday and eat something. All right, let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank you so much for tears. Lord, I guess tears are a universal language. Sometimes, God, we cry when we're happy. Most of the time, Lord, it's when we're sad. Lord, there may be someone in our building. Matter of fact, I know there are. I'm a pastor that are going through some difficult times right now. Those tears are coming in the midnight hour when nobody knows. But God, I'm glad you said you'll wipe away all tears. Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to never lose our brokenness, realizing that the tenderness is what can change the world. Jesus, bless our food tonight, our fellowship tonight, Thank you for giving me another year with this precious church. Thank you for letting me be a part of this and what you're going to do. And Lord, we're excited about that. 
In Christ's name, amen.